to the meeting of the ad hoc on COVID-19 Recovery and Neighborhood Investment Committee. This is Wednesday, October 21st. Why don't we start with, uh, please call the roll, Mr. Clerk. Yes, um, Madam Chair. Uh, Council Member Nuri Martinez. Uh, present. Council Member Herb Wesson. Council Member Curran Price. Present. Council Member Gil Cedillo. Present. Council Member Micho Farrell. Present. You have a quorum, Madam. You have a All quorum, right, Thank Madam. you, Mr. City Clerk. Uh, we're going to go ahead and begin with uh, public comment. Uh, Mr. City Attorney, would you please explain our speaking rules to the members of the public? Thank you, Madam Chair. To members of the public calling in, when you hear the last four digits of your phone number being called out, it will be your turn to speak. Please press star, star six to speak and state which of the agenda items you would like to speak on. You will have one minute per item to speak, up to two minutes total. We will tell you when your time is up. When speaking on the agenda items, you must be on topic. Our goal is to get through as many speakers as we can. If you are not speaking on topic, or if we cannot tell whether you are speaking on an agenda item, you will get one brief warning from me or the chair. If you do not immediately get clearly on topic, or again stray off topic, the chair will cut you off and you will forfeit the rest of your speaking time. And we will move on to the next speaker. We will take a total of 15 minutes of public comment, or up to 15 minutes. Finally, for members of the public calling in to speak, as soon as you hear someone address you, you are live in the council meeting. If you are also listening to the council meeting on your computer, channel 35 or another device, please turn down your volume on those devices immediately. There is a time delay between the live meeting and the broadcast on those devices, and it will cause confusion if you continue to listen on your other device. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. City Attorney. Why don't we go ahead and take the first caller? Caller ending in 5803. Press star six to unmute yourself. Please state your name and the item you'd like to speak on. Hi, good afternoon, uh, committee members. My name is Jacob Van Horn. I'd like to make a comment on item number two, please. Okay, you have one minute. Please please go ahead. Thank you. Uh, thanks for considering the motion to refund the Alfresco program. This is a really vital lifeline for restaurants, many of which we've already lost permanently uh, in downtown Los Angeles. I'm ecstatic to see programs for outreach are being funded and that there's a motion passed in transportation that will extend the temporary program for at least six months past the LEP. However, I feel that $2 million in funding isn't going to be nearly enough. I implore this committee to consider an amendment that will increase that number. We need to help as many of these struggling businesses that are the lifeblood of our city in any way we can while the CARES funds are still available. Please consider this as you move forward. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next speaker. Caller ending in 9829. Press star 6 to unmute yourself. Please state your name and the item you'd like to speak on. Caller ending in 9829. Press star 6 to unmute yourself. Next speaker. Caller ending in 0408. Press star 6 to unmute yourself. Please state your name and the item you'd like to speak on. Caller ending in 0408. Press star 6 to unmute yourself. Next speaker. Caller ending in 3511. Press star 6 to unmute yourself. Please state your name and the items you'd like to speak on. Deborah Bell Holt, the DWP funding. Okay, you have one minute. Go ahead. My question is, is how are you going to decipher which um, community uh, stakeholder to be able to receive the funding? Due to the process of some of us have been um, consumers for over 20 years and our applications have not been renewed. Anything else, Speaker? 
No, thank you. All right, thank you. Next caller. Caller ending in 9829. Press star 6 to unmute yourself. Please state your name and the items you'd like to speak on. Hi, yes, this is Blair Beston, and I would like to speak on item number two, please. You have a minute. Go ahead. Thank you. I just wanted to echo what the uh, one of the other commenters said about extending the uh, money investment in the Alfesco program. Um, we have a number of applications in, that are interested in our district, as well as hundreds across the city. Um, you guys were thankfully able to get six million dollars for street vending um, through this uh, through a program through COVID. And we would just like to see a match for our brick and mortar businesses. Um, they are the lifeblood of our city in terms of business, but also in terms of attraction for tourism and amenities for the residents. So please consider uh, raising the dollar amount. Thank you. I just want to state that there is a $40 million allocation for brick and mortar businesses, which they can apply for as well. Um, can I take the next caller? Caller ending in 4469, press star 6 to unmute yourself. Please state your name and the item you'd like to speak on. Sibone, uh, uh, item number one. You have one minute. Go ahead. Hello, my name is Sibone with Scope. Um, I'm glad I'm just speaking on item number one. I'm glad to see that there's progress in terms of the utility debt campaign. Um, the $50 million allocation is a good step. There's a long way to go before we can assure that all people that suffer from utility debt uh, receive the help that they need. It's important that the next steps are made alongside with community organizations, with Party Power LA, to maximize efforts um, of the campaign and to enact long-term change in, um, in L.A. to help our community members. So I hope you take that into consideration, um, and thank you for your time. Thank you. Next caller. Caller ending in 8481. Press star 6 to unmute yourself. Caller ending in 8481. Press star 6 to unmute yourself. Please state your name and the items you'd like to speak on. Caller ending in 8481. Press star 6 to unmute yourself. Next caller. Caller ending in 1814. Press star 6 to unmute yourself. Please state your name and the items you'd like to speak on. Hi, good afternoon. Uh, Steffi Jimenez, Community Power Collective and the LA Street Vendor Campaign, item number nine. We're very worried that this motion will further limit spaces already available due to brick and mortar stores taking merchandise outside, uh, also including the red zones, meters, and other working sectors encroaching into the vendor spaces when they already have designated areas already. Uh, in order for this project to have a positive impact, we'd like CD1 officials to reach out to local vendors and speak and gain their support for this initiative, since the result could impact local vendors that have been vital to the Westlake community economy and cultural life, and any pilot program or plan that would have an impact, positive or negative, on vendors who have been struggling since prior to the pandemic, needs to include a full analysis of vending regulations that are barriers to legal vending so that we can modify or rewrite a much better vending law to promote inclusive vending in the city, such as a special vending district. And this analysis should include direct investment in legal vending cards that to this day do not fully exist and which continue to be one of the main obstacles to legal vending in L.A. City. Thank you. Thank you. Next caller. Caller ending in 6275. Press star 6 to unmute yourself. Caller ending in 6275. Press star 6 to unmute yourself. Caller ending in 9685. Press star 6 to unmute yourself. Please state your name and uh, items you'd like to speak on. Yes, my name is Irita, and uh, I'm a DWP customer 
also a member of SCOPE, and I'm calling about the help we need for our bills here. It's getting outlandish. It's crazy. People can't go to work. They can't do what they have to do to make money, and bills are getting over, sure. over the top. Go, go ahead, and, and you have a minute. Go ahead. There, it's over the top. I'm concerned because my bill's over the top. We need help. We need help right away here in South LA. Thank you. Thank you, Ness. Next speaker. Caller ending in 3756, press star 6 to unmute yourself. Caller, please state your name and the item you'd like to speak on. Hi, yes. My name is Sonia, and I would like to speak on item number one. Um, yes, um, a lot of people like myself that need extra help because a lot of people in the community don't have two-parent household to help out, and um, it's harder um, on a single parent um, that is barely making it. So um, I would like, you know, for them to actually the DWP to help, you know, with the utility bills. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker. Caller ending in 3511. Press star 6 to unmute yourself. Hung up. Caller ending in 6649. Press star 6 to unmute yourself. Please state your name and the item you'd like to speak on. Please state your name and the item you'd like to speak on. Please state your name and the item you'd like to speak on. Caller ending in 6390, press star 6 to unmute yourself. Caller ending in 6390, press star 6 to unmute yourself. Please state your name and the Hi. item you'd like to speak on. Hi, this is Tiffany Wong with SCOPE and the Repower LA Coalition. Um, thank you for the uh, speaking on item number one. Okay, you have one minute. Go ahead. Thank you for the work of the city and the council president to come up with $50 million in CARES funding. And building off of the comments from SCOPE members Deborah and Irisa, um, how are decision makers making sure that these utility debt relief program is equitable, accessible, and targeted? Um, so really urge uh, collaboration with the Repower LA Coalition to maximize this opportunity and make sure these processes are simplified for customers. Um, some of our recommendations are in partnering with uh, CBOs and offering uh, resources and support for ratepayers and in making improvements um, to existing low-income programs as well as creating an advisory committee of community stakeholders, ratepayers, and staff to create this program, um, and reporting on data equity metrics Thank on you, whether this program is meeting. Thank you. Next speaker. Caller ending in 2252, press star 6 to unmute yourself. Please state your name and the item you'd like to speak on. Cameron, and I'd like to speak on item one. Okay, you have one minute. Go ahead. Okay, I am Cameron, and I'm from the Repower LA uh, Coalition. I would like to mention uh, something very much in line with the SCOPE members who have talked already, that our coalition's been fighting for solutions to utility debt relief for low-income families. We want to applaud the work of the city and of City Council President Nuri Martinez to come up with this $50 million in CARES funding. And we're sure that that's going to be an excellent, great step uh, toward getting rid of the utility debt on low income Angelinos. And, you know, just I want to acknowledge that this hasn't been matched by other municipal utilities in the country. And at the same time, we really want to urge that LEDWP staff report to the Board of Commissioners in one month uh, to talk about the enrollment of black and brown low income families. And if the data shows that there's barriers and limited enrollment, the staff needs to work with community advocates uh, to produce concrete results. Um, especially given that 40% of black households and 30% of Latinx households paid more than double the amount compared to 26% of all LA households. This Fresh Start program Thank you, uh, is 
you. Very innovative. Thank you. Caller ending in 6649, press star 6 to unmute yourself. Hello. Please state your name and the item you'd like to speak on. My name is Linda. I'd like to speak on item one. Just to note, although you, they you, are not you turning off utilities. Hello? Yes, you have one minute. Go ahead. Okay. Yes. Um, although they are not turning off utilities right now, what happens when the pandemic ends? Will there be back payments due? Perhaps we should develop a sister company uh, for DWP that will not monopolize our communities, our neighborhoods, our homes. We should have a choice. Making a fresh start, helping us all, perhaps with a new system in place, will be a very good thing to do. Thank you. Thank you. Next Call speaker. Caller ending in 8481, press star 6 to unmute yourself. Caller ending in 8481, press star 6 to unmute yourself. Please state your name and the items you'd like to speak on. Hello, my name is Susana Ramirez. I'm a vendedor ambulante in Macarton Park. No queremos tantas restricciones for the COVID-19. Son muy espacios, que no nos reduzcan los espacios. Queremos para los carros de, de comida. Caller ending in 3756, press star 6 to unmute yourself. Caller ending in 3756, press star 6 to unmute yourself. Caller ending in 6649, press star 6 to unmute yourself. Already, but Please I don't state know. your name and the item you'd like to speak on. Yes, this is Linda. I represent Scope. Perhaps it is DWP's turn to step up and forgive all debts that's owed to us. Uh, as I stated before, developing a sister company would be just wonderfully well. Many of the DWP recipients are impacted by this COVID. Being the fact that that is persons that are working from home, of course, that means we're using our utilities more. The give back program is essential that we may continue to sustain and uh, live our basic quality of life. Thank you. Thank you. That concludes public comment for today's ad hoc meeting. Uh, members, uh, so we're going to go ahead and close public comment, Mr. S um, City Clerk. Uh, members, I'd like to take items 4 through 10 on consent unless anyone has any comments or questions. All right, seeing none, uh, those will be approved without objection on consent. So let's move on to item number 1. Mr. City Clerk, can you please read num item 1 into the record? Certainly, ma Madam Chair. Item number 1 is uh, CLA. Chief Legislative Analyst Report relative to the COVID-19 Utility Grant Program. All right, thank you. And so members, uh, before us, we have a report that would launch a $50 million utility assistance program. As you all know, this committee, or ad hoc, I should say, has been working diligently to ensure that we are providing financial assistance to the very people that need it the most. And that's been the commitment of this ad hoc from the onset. We've launched a number of programs to assist families and our residents. So today, I'm hoping that we're able to approve the launch of another program uh, to provide utility assisting grants for up to 100,000 Angelinos in our city. Even with the launching of this program, um, I know that the utility assistance isn't done, so we're gonna continue to work on this effort. Uh, my office has been working with DWP to figure out how it can provide debt relief to the lowest income Angelinos um, and we'll be discussing this at a later date, but this is a, the, the report before us. I know we have Mr. Chris, Chris Espinosa with us from the CLA's office to provide an overview of the report. Um, so we also have a DWP staff to answer any questions, so let's, them, let's let them into the meeting. Okay, I see three folks. Um, thank you very much. As soon as uh, we get to the members, we can go to you. So Mr. Espinosa, why don't you give us a brief overview of the report before us? Thank you, Councilwoman. Um, 
my name is Chris Espinosa. I'm with the Office of the Chief Legislative Analyst um, Office. And before you is a CLA report responding to two motions, a motion Martinez uh, Price concerning a $50 million allocation to, of CARES Act funds for the development of a right to recover program. And secondly, a motion Martinez Price relative to developing a DWP utility debt relief program. Um, our office looks at a number of programs throughout the country and uh, checks out the U.S. Department of Treasury guidelines to try to use the coronavirus relief funds in the um, appropriate manner. Um, when we started doing research on this, we found that, um, that the most expeditious way to spend the $50 million in coronavirus relief funds currently set aside for the Right to Recover initiative would be to implement a utility grant program in partnership with the Department of Water and Power for eligible households facing economic hardship due to COVID-19. Um, the CLA found that providing a financial credit for water, electricity, and trash service would be ineligible due to federal restrictions concerning revenue replacement. So this program, the proposed utility grant program, would provide a $500 check to eligible applicants specifically for gas service, cellular phone, Wi-Fi, and internet and cable television service. Um, if you recall, we had a presentation by the Committee for Greater LA. They produced a report in September of 2020 speaking about the importance of utilities, specifically internet service, as a right um, for not only education, but for information and cr critical news service. And that because much of this utilities are bundled in um, uh, utility payments, that um, that is why we are recommending that these specific utilities are the applicable um, use for these funds. Uh, the proposed utility grant program is estimated to help approximately 100,000 individuals. Um, to confirm city residency, the applicant must be an active DWP customer, and the household income eligibility will align with the DWP's low income discount program, which is approximately 50% of the area medium income. Um, the Department of Housing and Community Investment Department believes that there are 430,000 households that would be eligible for the program, and DWP reports that they already have 200,000 individuals enrolled in their low-income customer assistance programs. The uh, DW, due to time constraints, DWP will only accept applications online and through the department website. Individuals will be required to self-certify that they have been financially impacted by COVID-19 the COVID-19 pandemic, and that they meet the household income requirement aligned with the uh, low-income discount program. Um, applicants will be um, also be required to electronically submit at least uh, one document showing that they've had a COVID-19 um, impact. The applicants will be selected through a lottery system with existing DWP low-income program participants receiving priority status. If the uh, program is approved, DWP has confirmed that they will assign the necessary staff to develop an online registration webpage, review applications for eligibility, and implement protocols to conduct the lottery selection system and award grants or checks to eligible applicants. Um, we hope to, uh, if it's approved, launch the program November 2nd, 2020. There'll be a two-week application uh, submission period, and then we will do the lottery review the applications, and then we'll have grant distribution starting in November and working all the way through December 18th. And uh, I thank you very much, and we have DWP staff to also answer questions. I appreciate it. Thank you very much, Mr. Espinosa. Let's take uh, questions from our members. Mr. O'Farrell? Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you uh, for your leadership uh, and, and Mr. Price for your second on this very important uh, program. Thank you, Mr. Espinosa, for your work and your report on this. I am so happy to see this item scheduled uh, and this utility grant program come into fruition. Um, 
Colleagues, 2020 will be remembered as an inflection point in our history as a country. The COVID-19 pandemic, along with the long simmering unresolved social issues, flashpoints have erupted, which have brought into sharp focus the high profile killings of unarmed black people across the country, including George Floyd by the police in Minneapolis. Laid bare for more people to see than ever before are the systemic wealth, racial and structural inequalities that already existed right here in Los Angeles. As the report stated, about six in 10 LA households have reported having lost their jobs, have been furloughed, had wages or hours significantly reduced since the COVID-19 pandemic began and the emergency orders went into place. Some sectors of our economy, however, are as strong as ever, but many who lived paycheck to paycheck before the pandemic struck were already struggling to make ends meet. This kind of program targets exactly the people that we need to help. And I, I thank you for that. For the hundreds of thousands of Angelinos fortunate enough to be working from home, and we hope more people will be able to do that. And others though, who are largely confined to their homes, who are out of work, of course, the utility bills are increasing. Staying at home from nine to 5 p.m. or more shifts the burden of paying for utilities from companies to residents. And again, it goes without saying, but I'll say it, most of whom are struggling. I personally, and I'm sure all of you have heard from colleagues, direct, or constituents rather, directly, firsthand, and members of your staffs like mine in the field have been hearing personal stories about the serious burdens that residents in, in my district are facing to cover just basic essential costs and serve for the services. So I support, um, very strongly, whatever we can do to ease the sheltering at home that is the reality uh, in, in the year 2020 in COVID, um, programs like this utility grant program. I just have a few very specific program uh, questions, and that is uh, how will recipients receive their, their checks or their grants? Oh. Good afternoon, council member. We plan to mail those out. Uh, we'll actually start the mailing in December. So by December 18th, we hope to have all the checks mailed. We are working with our commercial bank. We can mail approximately 18,000 checks a day. So once all the applications are vetted, then we'll start the mailing process. Wonderful, thank you. And what uh, languages are we able to communicate um, this program to eligible residents? I know that uh, with the rental assistance uh, program, the subsidy program, that's available in multiple languages. Is there a consistency in terms of translation services announcing this to eligible recipients? I think right now we're planning to do English and Spanish, and we're also working with our community-based organizations to share with them our program, and then they can help us with additional re out outreach. Terrific. Let us know if we can help. I mean, the 13th District has so many languages between Cantonese and Mandarin and, and of course, Armenian. Uh, so any of those languages uh, that you need special assistance in, uh, let us know. We have native indigenous languages. So there are certainly barriers to that that we're gonna wanna help with. Uh, and then lastly, um, how, how will folks be alerted? Will it be through their, the billing system that they currently participate in, whether it be online or through the mail? Our customer service division is gonna be holding a workshop uh, next week to work with the community-based organizations and our public affairs division is working on a campaign now to get the word out. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thanks again, Madam Chair. Thank, thank you, you so Mr. O Thank you, Mr. O'Farrell. Mr. Price? Hey, Madam Chair. First of all, thank you for your leadership uh, on this issue. I know it's something you've been working on for a, a minute, uh, but the utility grant program, as uh, uh, Councilman O'Farrell said, is just so desperately needed. Certainly in uh, the area that I represent, it's going to come in very, very handy. Uh, a couple of quick questions, though. Uh, you indicated, the staff indicated there's already 200,000 people in the uh, low-income assistance program, and that we intend to serve 400,000. Are these 200 automatically kind of in the pool, or are they going to have to apply or reapply? Oh, wow. 
Yes. All applicants will have to apply. We'll give priority to our current low income discount program uh, customers first. We know they've already went through the vetting process. And then to the extent there's open opportunities, the ones that have also applied that meet the low income uh, guidelines will be eligible as well. Okay. And you mentioned that they'll be physically receiving a physical check. Is that correct? A check, not a card, not something else? That That's is correct. And they technically could use that check for anything other than these utilities, correct? Or well, we're set, we're giving them the check to assist with their bills. We're not planning to follow up to uh, look okay. at that, how they, how they use. Okay, great. Uh, and then lastly, uh, I think uh, the comment, just follow up on how the, the indicated that you have to have a computer to log on to sign up for this. Is that correct? I believe you can do it off a smartphone. So one of the things we plan to do with our community-based program outreach next week is to actually demo it to the uh, organization so they can help others as well. But uh, the plan is to be able to use your, your uh, smartphone to do it as well. Okay, great. Well, it's going uh, to be much needed and I'm sure uh, it will be uh, greatly appreciated by those lucky enough to receive them. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Mr. Price. Mr. Cedillo? Madam Chair, let me first of all commend you uh, for your leadership, um, the authors of the motions for their leadership and vision. Uh, we are trying to do the, the best with what we have with the appropriate response from government at this point. But let me also offer constructively some suggestions. It seems to me that we may want to figure out a way not to cut checks, but rather to just debit uh, the utility costs of the participants. And as Mr. Uh, Price noted, since we have a pool of participants already, it seems that that would be the obvious pool to look at. So in terms of both efficiency, dollars saved, and you know, question of equity and fairness, it seems like maybe we would just want to, you know, debit uh, each person's bill. And, and in fact, since we're, this is going to hit 100,000 individuals, but there's 200,000 already eligible and enrolled, seems like we would do one of two things, either figure out a way to uh, help the entire 200,000 or they just look at the 100,000 who are the lowest, um, lowest earners who have the lowest, uh, have the highest quality of, of uh, qualifications to participate in this program. That would save us the price of the checks, it would save us the administrative costs of dealing with the banks, that would save us the time, that would save us uh, Perhaps the um, instances where there may be poor judgment, where, where the checks may not arrive. I mean, there's a whole range of things that could be avoided if we simply took advantage of our uh, IT uh, experiences and expertise and simply debited everyone's uh, bill. And yes, Councilman, um, it's Chris Espinosa from the CLA. We, we did... Um, develop a sample program just as you outlined um, and we ran it through um, review with the city attorney's office um, the issue was um, that there's a distinct restriction in the Treasury guidelines having to do with revenue replacement and since DWP is a municipally owned utility we receive a power revenue transfer uh, to support city services, um, that there would be an issue regarding revenue replacement. So we um, took a look at other utilities that are just as important to the community and developed a program that would be a grant. And that's why we developed this check of $500 to assist with alternative utility costs. You know, I don't want to uh, have a family fight here, but we've spent the morning hearing from other colleagues of mine upset with the city attorney, uh, many mistakes, uh, many errors that are costing us millions of dollars, frankly, uh, on simple uh, matters and issues. Uh, and I, I just can't imagine, uh, I understand uh, the intent and the purpose, but I just cannot imagine that a legal mind could not come to an analysis and assessment that shows a more efficient and effective uh, disbursement consistent with the mission and goals 
and intents of the of the law and the legislation, one that that, that resulted in a more efficient and effective uh, result both for the uh, utility, for the city, and most importantly, for the consumer. And uh, so I would hope that perhaps maybe we look at that again, uh, because this does not seem to be the best way to accomplish the, the goals of this uh, program. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Cedillo. Mr. Espinosa, I have a couple of questions for you. So um, as you all know, we have a hard deadline um, for the CARES Act money. So how do we make sure that we can stick to that timeline outlined in the report? I know we want to make sure that we can get to all $50 million out the door and in the hands of the very people who need it. So I just want to make sure that there is a commitment that we have to meet this deadline. Yes, uh, DWP will be assigning extra staff to administer the program. Um, we've developed a self-certification so um, that you know, we, we take people at their word that they are um, been impacted by COVID-19 and that they meet the low income um, requirements. They do have to submit um, documentation, but we only require one piece of document um, to, to implement that. So um, their staff will be going through that quickly, but we do have um, a good level of confidence that we're going to get this money out. And so is the November 2nd launch date, that's realistic? We're going to be able to do that? Yes, we started early um, on this program. Once we um, started to define the project, um, I've been working with DWP staff very closely, and they've already started to develop the um, online applications, um, the requirements. So we've been working hand in hand so that we have a jump on this um, prior to uh, full approval. And is there any ad administrative costs associated to all this that uh, we need to know about? There are administrative costs, but um, I believe DWP will absorb those as part of their uh, program. That's good to know. Yes. And then my final question is, since the application will be online, um, do we know if DWP has, uh, will their cost center be available to answer any of the questions? Just want to make sure that uh, we ensure that the applicants have a way to get all their questions answered as they're going through the application process. Yes, we've been working very closely with George Rafael over at um, the Department of Water and Power. He's the head of the customer service unit, and they will be assigning um, um, members of their customer service staff to make sure to handle calls and to assist individuals through the application process. I certainly appreciate your help in all this. I know that um, we're all in agreement we need to get um, the money in the hands of people that need it the most and get some some relief for them as soon as possible. So I appreciate the work of the department and yourself um, along with my staff. So members, if there are no other further questions, I'd like to approve the recommendations in the CLA report. So without objection, that will be the order. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you, Mr. Espinosa. Thank you. Let's move on to item number two. Mr. Clerk, can you please read that into the record? Certainly, Madam Chair. Item number two is a motion, motion to Corian O'Farrell Martinez and see the administrative officer and Department of Transportation to report relative to the CARES Act funds for the continuation, support, and expansion of the LA Al Fresco program. All right, thank you. Um, we have Salida Jones, I'm sorry, Salida Reynolds from the Department of Transportation. Um, can we please let her into our meeting? Ms. Reynolds? Salida, can you hear us? Salida, can you hear us? Yes. There you are. And we, do we have Daniel Mitchell? Okay, there yes. you are. So, um, so we have the Department of Transportation on our meeting to provide us with an overview on their report and the Alfresco program. So do you want to kick us off, Ms. Reynolds? Sure, and um, I'm going to introduce Rose McCarran, who has been the, really the lead on creating this program for the city and um, set this up in really record time, a huge program that has processed now thousands of requests from um, uh, restaurants throughout the city uh, to open up dining and welcome, in, uh, welcome people back 
either uh, in their own parking lots on the sidewalk if there's room and where there's not, um, reusing and repurposing uh, parking spaces uh, to do that. So I'm going to turn it over to Rose, who I believe is on as well. Let me make sure she's on. Ms. McCarran, can you hear us? Yes, I can hear you. There you go. So why don't you go ahead and start? Thank you. Um, as Salita said, I'm Rose McCarran. I'm a supervising transportation planner with LADOT. I'm going to be presenting our response to the motion presented by council members Kikorian and O'Farrell. Um, and provide details on how CARES Act funding will support the continuation and expansion of the LA Alfresco program. The LA Alfresco program is a COVID-19 emergency response program to support restaurants and help them to comply with public health directives during these economically challenging times. Mayor Garcetti issued directives across multiple city departments to streamline requirements and approvals for outdoor dining. As Salida mentioned, there are three options available to restaurants either using the sidewalk, uh, a private parking lot, or if those aren't available, we can provide space on the street. Um, local businesses have expressed overwhelming demand for the LA Alfresco program um, and have described it as a lifeline for keeping these local restaurants in business. To date, over 2,000 restaurants have received approval for one or more of the outdoor dining options. LADOT's core values of equity and safety uh, have guided our development of on-street dining areas. We are directing 55% of current program resources to businesses in impacted communities. Those are neighborhoods that have suffered significant job loss to COVID-19 or that are historically disadvantaged. We also prioritize safety in both the location and the design of our on-street dining areas. At the launch of LA Alfresco, LA DOT procured equipment, some of which we rent month to month, to install on-street dining areas on an emergency basis, primary, primarily using LADOT's fiscal year 1920 general fund contractual services. To date, LADOT has installed 52 curbside dining areas that serve an individual restaurant and five larger lane closures that support multiple restaurants. In total, we're supporting 76 restaurants with dining areas on the street at no cost to these businesses. Due to the overwhelming success of the program, LADOT has exhausted our initial supply of traffic control materials. And we currently have a backlog of pre-approved on-street dining locations, uh, approximately six closures and 75 curbside dining areas. The proposed CARES Act funding will allow LADOT to address this backlog and install on-street dining areas citywide. Um, at the program launch, we anticipated that we would support on-street dining for three months during the emergency. As the pandemic continues to impact restaurants, there's a clear longer term need for outdoor dining options to support these businesses and maintain public health. So with CARES funding, LADOT can purchase traffic control materials to ensure the program can continue throughout the duration of this emergency. We will work in coordination with the General Services Department to secure traffic control materials through emergency purchase orders to benefit the restaurants as quickly as possible. We anticipate that we can purchase enough materials to support 70 curbside dining areas and 20 lane closures. Although the exact mix of these on-site, on-street dining installations may change based on the number of applications received. Uh, the remainder of the funds will support labor costs to ensure rapid deployment of these installations, as well as contracted services for engagement with impacted communities. Uh, further, LADOT is working in coordination with our partner departments to launch a do-it-yourself program that will allow restaurants to sponsor their own on-street dining area. To ensure safety of restaurant patrons on the street, LADOT will continue to review these potential locations prior to granting a business approval to self-install. We expect on-street dining through LA Alfresco to iterate as the needs of businesses evolve through the pandemic and, and as we gain more experience uh, to improve project delivery. Funding the program through the CARES Act will allow a rapid deployment of on-street dining installations that will help support the businesses that have been impacted by the pandemic and help them comply with public health directives. And with that, I thank you and we can take any questions. Okay, thank you members. Are there any questions? Mr. O'Farrell? Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, let, me, let me start by, by thanking the mayor and, and thanking Salida and Rosemary, thank you for your report. Uh, this alfresco dining, clearly, as, as the report just conveyed, 
has been a real big success and a critical lifeline to restaurants across uh, the city, many of which are in the 13th district. Um, we all know that according to a Yelp survey three, four months ago, it's believed and the, the realities are bearing out that around 60% of restaurants will never open again. This is really serious, monumental economic impact realities uh, here that we're, we're living with. Um, it, it's also worth noting again, I say this like a broken record every time we talk about restaurants, but pre-COVID, restaurants employed one out of every 10 workers in the city of Los Angeles. So the math is pretty easy to come to in terms of the impacts on employment uh, and restaurants, many of which are mom and pop with local employed uh, residents in all of our very wonderful neighborhoods across the city of Los Angeles. Um, and as a consequence of COVID-19, uh, the ones that are able to operate are experiencing acute economic distress, hanging on by a thread for the most part. Uh, and this Al Fresco program is sometimes just the thing that will keep restaurants going. So I was very proud to co-introduce this with Mr. Kikorian and, and with your support, uh, Madam Chair. I know that we've heard from many restaurants in my district about the impact of being able to operate outdoor dining uh, and their ability to stay open. So a, a few brief questions that I have, having said all that, is in terms of the prioritizing of the disadvantaged, the historically disadvantaged communities, great. Um, is there a system that we're going to employ uh, to, to make sure uh, that that's rolled out and the assistance goes where it's needed the most? Yes, when we receive the applications, we prioritize applications that are in those impacted communities. Uh, to date, we have been prioritizing those applications. So of the 52 that we've rolled out, approximately 50% of those are in the impacted communities. Um, and we, at this point, only have a handful left in our queue that need to be implemented in, in those impacted communities. Uh, we will also, as I said, be working on an engagement contract to make sure that we're identifying those groups that maybe haven't heard about the program and doing some education and helping them apply. Right, and guidelines, CDC guidelines. Uh, there, are, you know, A lot of people still don't wanna go out in the open um, and are reluctant and they're gonna kind of venture out slowly, especially God willing as, as the pandemic is able to ease because of treatment and or vaccines. Um, what's the communication uh, and you know, the education on, in terms of following CDC guidelines? To this point, that education hasn't been part of the LA Alfresco program. Um, as part of the application process and as part of the agreement that we enter into for on-street dining, we point applicants to the public health guidelines and they self-certify that they will uh, comply with those guidelines. We also have uh, inspectors from street services doing spot checks um, and helping businesses comply. Okay, and my last question, uh, can businesses apply uh, for their own closures for parklets, et cetera, um, if they have the means to do it and work with DOT on the feasibility of whatever proper arrangement needs to be made for that closure of whether it be a wide, you know, part of a wide sidewalk or a parking lot or a street even? Yes, businesses can receive an automatic authorization uh, to use at least part of the sidewalk. Um, in terms of anything that would go on the street, um, which could be, you know, creating a pedestrian pathway on the street so that a restaurant could use the whole sidewalk or creating dining areas on the street. Um, we are working towards creating a, a program where restaurants can sponsor their own on-street dining area. Um, we've recently designed a site plan that applicants can use as a template for installing their own curbside dining area. We've installed this at three locations and we're evaluating how this, how this plan works. Um, and given the queue of applications, 
we plan to provide a soft launch of that program in the coming weeks with some of the restaurants that have already applied. And we anticipate a more public launch of allowing applicants to build their own curbside dining areas um, as soon as possible and before the end of the year. It's wonderful to hear. Um, and I'm so pleased that, you know, we always have to look for a silver lining that one of the consequences long after COVID, we look at it in the rearview mirror, one of the consequences will be that alfresco dining lives on in some form or another. Maybe not lane closures, but perhaps an easier way to engage in outdoor dining in Los Angeles, like all great cities in a Mediterranean climate um, have you know, taken advantage of in the past. So I'm happy to see that that's being looked at and I'd like to help figure that out for sure. And to all the callers and the restaurants, we know that this doesn't work for everyone. We know that. We know that some sometimes takeout doesn't even work for your business model. So we're continuing to look for ways to help those restaurants, um, uh, you know, just exist and and su survive through this this struggle that you're all feeling. Uh, so I thank everyone for their patience. And again, thank you, DOT, for your work in, in this. Um, and um, I look forward to seeing. Al Fresco prosper across the city. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. O'Farrell. Mr. Price? Thank you, Madam President. I too want to uh, thank uh, Salida and, and Rosemary for, for the presentation and, uh, and for the uh, Department of Transport team that really put this together quickly and I think very efficiently. Uh, I don't have uh, many um, restaurant operators per se in, in my district in CD9, but I sure have a lot of folks who work in restaurants. And so, uh, as Councilman O'Farrell mentioned, this has really been a lifeline uh, to, to uh, restaurants wherever they are. But speaking wherever they are, I am curious about the, uh, the location of the ones that have been approved to date. I know you said that there's an effort to, to uh, give some purpose to impacted communities. Uh, but I'd like to see a list of exactly where those restaurants are that have benefited from the program to date. And you mentioned that there was some uh, waiting uh, for, uh, for uh, I guess, financial assistance uh, to move forward. So if I could get some idea, could you give us some idea where, where they are district-wise, uh, eight, nine, and 10, for example? Yeah, we can definitely provide that information both for what has been installed and what we plan to install should we uh, receive this funding. Okay. Uh, and then finally, um, Talk a little bit about the, uh, the self-installed locations. How, well, first of all, back up. So how does a business go about uh, applying uh, or inquiring about uh, eligibility? Right, so we, um, we set up an easy online portal for applicants. There's sort of a one-stop shop for them to go through an application. Um, if they go through the application for either sidewalk dining or private property dining, Really, they just enter the information about their location, their contact information, and they agree to the terms and conditions of the program. And once they do that, they get an authorization to begin using that outdoor dining area right away. And do they need that if they're using their own parking lot? Correct. Yes. Or can they, they, they need to get uh, DOT approval to use their parking lot for that purpose? If it's, if it's a privately owned parking lot, they yeah. don't need DOT approval. Um, they'll get that automatic authorization just to go forward. Um, if there's anything on the street, that requires some review. And so our review process is looking at the safety and eligibility of the location. So we wanna make sure that the speed, the speed limit on the street is low enough that we feel comfortable putting diners on the street there. We want to make sure we're not black, blocking a fire hydrant in case there's a fire and create another you know, public safety issue. Um, so we take a lot of factors into account um, when reviewing that eligibility. Well, again, I joined uh, with Councilman O'Farrell and said we want to really promote this as much as possible amongst our, our restaurants uh, and services. So I'm, I'm anxious to, to look at that list that you can provide of, of where, they are, where those approvals have currently exist. Uh, and now we can work with you to get the word out to encourage more businesses to take advantage of this program. We'd appreciate but, that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Price. Mr. Cedillo? Uh, I 
almost hate to speak for uh, to re to um, replicate what my colleagues have said, but um, but the city staff and the city leadership deserve the accolades, and so let me first of all give kudos to everybody who's put this together. Second, let me note, uh, 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 Mr. Price, particularly you and I have uh, similar profiles of our communities we represent, and I will tell you, places like La Paria over on Wilshire and Whitmer, they are very excited about this program. Uh, they are executing it. Uh, but also Las Casuelas up in Highland Park. Uh, these are lifelines, as Mr. Ofero said. These are lifelines to, uh, to these businesses. And so the two questions. One is basically, how do we amplify this? I want to see us uh, you know, take over the streets. I want to see us, uh, what Casuelas did is replicate what they did in, in their their parking lot in the back. I mean, they, you know, just some lights, some plants, uh, some markers, and, you know, they're in business. And this is going to save them, uh, hopefully, as we get through this, this process and wait for the next uh, CARES Act response. Uh, this is just a critical service. It's really thoughtful. Uh, I share uh, Mr. Farrow's uh, perspective that it's a program that we should keep ongoing uh, because it changes the culture of the city, uh, makes this a more kind of walkable city, a more uh, outdoor city. Uh, I'm enjoying to whenever I do get out to be out dining outside. It's a it's a great uh, experience. So my questions are twofold: one, how do we uh, amplify this program? And two, what are the expenses? I heard you talk about labor costs. Um, I I'm not sure what those costs would be. What what we're spending our money on? It seems like cost here would be related to more materials, supplies, and, and how we're assisting uh, the restaurants. It's the type of bricks and mortar. I know there was a discussion earlier about um, street vendors versus bricks and mortar. And for the city of Los Angeles, we don't uh, make a choice. We are for both uh, street vendors because we see them as micro enterprises and future bricks and mortar. And we're for bricks and mortar, obviously, because uh, they're the, the staple of the city and uh, are important, as uh, Mr. O'Farrell mentioned, 10% of every worker worked in a, in a uh, restaurant, so obviously vital to our, our local economy. So that's my question. Uh, one, how do we amplify? Two, what, break down the cost for us, because uh, I'm not understanding what we're paying for. Sure. Um, I'll take the second question first. So um, the costs are, mostly regarding the materials. So that's the vast, the vast majority of the fund, how the funds will be spent. Um, based on our rental costs thus far, a closure can be anywhere from $4,000 to $25,000, um, whereas a curbside dining area is more in the realm of three dollars to $6,000. Uh, so going forward, we'll purchase the equipment, which will change that cost model somewhat. Um, but you know, the majority of the funds will be to support that equipment that can help us create these on-site dining areas. Um, in terms of labor, there is some labor on LADOT side to receive and process the applications, review the site, um, particularly if it's a closure, that's a little bit uh, more of a complex process. That's typically facilitated by perhaps a council office or an organization um, and requires a more time of our engineering staff to design that closure. Um, and there is then staff cost for installing, being there, and uh, making sure that things are installed to our specifications. Another thing that's included in the funding is the outreach and engagement uh, contracting services as well. Just let me note, for me, um, all of them seem to be very legitimate costs, although it seems this review and processing the app seems to be something that we would do anyway. It seems something that, uh, particularly given that the, the department has been impacted by COVID by us not being out there doing some of our other uh, activities, uh, the fact that we were not uh, enforcing um, parking tickets, uh, it seems that uh, we would have uh, personnel and the staff available to participate in this program. This seems more like a management question, a question of redirecting um, talent within the uh, uh, department as opposed to additional work. But um, anyway, it's not for me to, to 
it's a perspective and a suggestion to, to look at. Uh, other than that, the sec the answer to the second question, what, or the first question was? Um, I think part of it is that engagement contract going out and uh, making sure more communities are aware of the opportunities. Um, I think that's going to be a big part of making it bigger. Um, especially with the private property dining, like you were mentioning, and a private parking lot or a sidewalk. Once um, once businesses are aware of it, it's very easy to apply and get that authorization and get started on the Alfresco program. Um, and I think there's also, just in terms of your longer term goals, there was a council report. Um, we've been asked to report back on making um, on-street Alfresco perhaps a longer term, um, something that lasts beyond this state of emergency. Let me also note, if I may, the um seems that we should also have support and partnership from the Chamber, uh, Central City Association, Restaurant Association, and those, uh, uh, what's our Bureau of Tourism and Visitors Bureau? It seems that uh, they should be really promoting this and helping us uh, with this because this is going to be the, the lifeblood of uh, this sector of our economy until we get past this uh, pandemic. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Madam President. Thank you, Mr. Cedillo. Um, I only have two questions. Um, so how many restaurants do you think will be able to serve with the additional funding? With additional funding if we ever get there? Um, I believe we'd be able to serve at least 100 additional restaurants, if okay. not more. And do we currently have a waiting list for the program? If so, how many restaurants are on that waiting list? We do. We currently have a waiting list of 75 uh, applicants for the curbside dining areas that serve the individual restaurants mm -hmm. and um, six for lane closures, which serve three to five restaurants each. Okay. Yeah. So additional funding would probably take care of those folks on the waiting list? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you for that. Um, I do have uh, Patty uh, Huber from the CEO's office who needs to read a technical amendment to this item. Are you there, Patty? Yes, ma'am, I'm here. Can okay. you hear me? Yes, I can. Go ahead and read the technical amendment before we move on. Yes. Um, the committee should receive and file the um, October 19th DOT re report and approve the following amended recommendations, which have been provided to the committee clerk. Number one, create a new account, number to be determined, entitled DOT CRF projects within CAO department number 10 COVID-19 federal relief fund number 63M to increase appropriations totaling 1,994,622 dollars within CAO department number 10 COVID-19 federal relief fund number 63M in the following accounts. 10T955, titled Reimbursement of City Expenditures for an amount of $310,331.80. And then account number to be determined CRF, DOT CRF projects for a total of uh, recommendation 3A is to transfer $310,331.80 from CAO Department Number 10 COVID-19 Federal Relief Fund Number 63M Account 10T955 Reimbursement of City Expenditures to the Reserve Fund Number 101 backslash 62 for reimbursement of eligible expenses. 3B, transfer $1,684,290.20 from CAO Department Number 10, COVID-19 Federal Relief Fund Number 63M to Fund 59C, Measure M Local Return Special Fund, account number to be determined, entitled <coughs> LA Alfresco Program. And finally, for direct the Department of General Services, <clears throat> excuse me, to work with LA DOT to issue emergency purchase orders that support the direction of the motion. Thank you. Thank you. And Mr. City Attorney, you have those technical amendments, right? Yes. I'm sorry, Mr. City Clerk, I 
looking at Mr. City Clerk and calling you City Attorney. I apologize, but you have all those in writing. Is that correct? Okay, great. So I'm going to go ahead and move that we approve as amended. Um, without objection, that will be the order. Uh, Mr. City Clerk, can you go ahead and read um, item number three into the record? Certainly, Madam Chair. Item number three is a Department of Aging report r relative to the Senior Meals Program's response to the pandemic. Okay, we have Laura Trejo from the Department of uh, the Aging Department. Do we, we're going to let her into the room, into our meeting? Ms. Trejo, can you hear us? Ms. Trejo, can you hear us? Yes, ma'am, I can. Can you hear me? Yes, um, we can hear you. So why don't you go ahead and provide an overview of the, re of, uh, the report? Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, first and foremost, I want to thank uh, the chairperson and the committee members for giving me this opportunity. Uh, I am here to report to you that we have continued to provide uh, senior meals to over 21,000 older adults throughout the city in great need uh, resulting from, from the pandemic. As you all know, older adults have been one of the most disproportionately uh, hit populations in terms of the impact of COVID-19. Uh, in fact, eight out of 10 of the deaths have been associated with persons over the age of 65. Uh, so we continue to monitor the situation and also continue to be aware that until there is a vaccine or other treatments, older adults will more than likely have severely uh, impacted their mobility in our community, uh, their access to resources uh, and other needs that they have. So we are working uh, tirelessly to try to, uh, with our partners in the community to try to figure out solutions that support older adults sheltering, being safe and well uh, and supported in the needs that they have. Uh, as you requested uh, when I was before you last, we provided you uh, an addendum. Um, the good news is that FEMA did extend the Great Plates program through November the 8th. Uh, so we're very happy about that. We're hopeful that there may be other extensions, but again, we cannot guarantee or know that in advance. Uh, we are requesting approval to continue the Senior Emergency Meals Program through the end of December um, in support of older adults who continue to be highly impacted uh, by the pandemic. Um, you have that information before you. Um, also, one of the things that I wanted to bring to your attention, and I actually submitted uh, an addendum to the report based on the staffing needs. Uh, to date, the department has not received any staffing support. We basically have been um, providing the staffing needed from existing um, savings and other efficiencies within the agency to be able to meet basic needs of, of supporting the program. Uh, but given the current budget anticipated uh, uh, reductions to our funding, uh, it's making it extremely uh, difficult for us to continue to provide that level of staff support to make sure that the program is running and operating effectively. Uh, in addition, the separation or retirements of um, senior management in the department is going to have also a critical impact on our ability to continue managing at this level. Um, we uh, are having some of our most seasoned managers uh, who have been critical to the success of this program to make sure that it was uh, run effectively. Uh, almost all of them are retiring within the next few weeks. So we're, um, asking also for consideration uh, of exemption from um, the um, hiring freezes that are currently in place to allow us to fill our grant funded positions, which most of our positions in the Department of Aging are uh, using uh, Federal Older Americans Act and other funds to be able to continue providing the level of support and services required to maintain 
um, the number of service contracts that we're currently overseeing and the level of um, services that we're delivering in the community. So I, I also have with me our Assistant General Manager, Jim Snon, and I wanted to give James an opportunity to share um, sort of his experience of uh, being uh, the operational lead of this program. I believe today may be one of the last times that James will have an opportunity to speak before your council as he will be one of those that is retiring. So if uh, James uh, can make a few comments about the program, please. Is he in our meeting? I believe so. Uh, he's well, muted, so he needs to unmute himself. James, can you hear us? Well, uh, I won't. He's, um, still, he's still muted. We can't hear him. Okay. Do you have a way to connect with him and let him know he's muted? I will do that, ma'am. Uh, thank you. Um, I've done it. Um, so in the meantime, I, I just wanted to, again, um, ask for your understanding. Um, the department really is a very small agency. And I think that all of us have been working at the highest level to make sure that uh, we're serving and responding to the needs of our community. But we also have limitations in just uh, the sheer number of people that we have to work with and uh, the ability to actually execute um, to, the, to the needs of the community at this time. All right, thank you. I'm so. gonna move on to um, members. Do you have any questions? Yes. Mr. O'Farrell? Yes, uh, thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. While we're waiting for Mr. Don, I have a feeling he'll show, I saw him earlier, so I have a feeling he'll be back. Mm -hmm. um, Ms. Trejo, thank you so much for what you do, your exceptional work. And also, uh, James, if, if this is the last time we get to interact with you, um, I'm sorry that you're retiring under the circumstances, but you've been an amazing partner and champion for seniors as well. Um, you've been the dream team in my experience of looking out after our seniors. So let me just say thank you um, for your work and your mission uh, because you believe in it so strongly and that comes, comes across very clearly. Um, so I think Mr. Kikorian, way back in the early stages of the pandemic and the emergency orders, um, he was given the task of, of rolling out the Great Plates Delivery Program, which uh, came with no instructions. <laughs> And uh, so uh, he, he did his best to put it together. And, you know, we, we rolled that out and kind of stuck with it. And it's evolved. There's a lot going on right now. I mean, there's the there's this senior meals program that uh, came from the, the Great Plates delivery program that our restaurants are involved in. Never fully met its promise, but it is fulfilling a critical need. And we're also now looking at delivering meals to seniors in a you know grocery form rather a box or actual staples mm -hmm. um, and these types of uh, meals we've all been participating and distributing i know that everyone uh, on all of us council members have participated i know in my office we work with about 20 different groups that deliver these, these types of mm -hmm. meals uh and or or have a drive-through where, where people pick them up i'm hopeful that in in, in a perfect world as we evolve and hopefully keep this senior restaurant meal delivery going, hopefully through the end of the year, that we can also stand up this deliver groceries at a senior's home program by working with some of our partners who have already ramped up the ability to do so. They've developed the infrastructure and we've worked with them. So um, I suppose I'm, the questions I have, um, Ms. Trejo, is, um, what, what's your sense of, of how many seniors might participating in a grocery delivery type program? Uh, I actually think it would be a, a welcome uh, opportunity for older adults um, in our community. Remember, this was a, a rapid response to a crisis. Uh, not everybody that we were uh, reaching out to was able to participate and partly was because we really only had one choice, which was homebound, 
uh, disabled, low income. We were really targeting uh, very high risk, high need individuals. I believe uh, that the work that we started last year with the food bank and other partners in the community who have been just amazing to all of us. Um, we've developed partnerships. You know, we have one of our centers who's currently delivering uh, in the tens of thousands of pounds of food. We have providers who never provided food before, basically converting their parking lots of their offices to serve local communities of all ages. So our provider network has, um, really stood up um, to respond to the needs of hunger associated with the pandemic. And we believe uh, very, very strongly and passionately that we can continue and grow. As you would see in the report, last time you asked me for alternatives and I told you it was one of them was the uh, delivering the staples so people can, I'm even working with people who are ready to write recipes for me so people can make best use of those. But I'm also thinking out of the box. I'm thinking, I know that Council Member Price and I talked about this probably three years ago about local community gardens and the opportunity that as seniors become to come out, communities can begin to use that model in an urban setting more effectively to produce sustainable food products that, that they can use. And so we are heartened that we're seeing lots of creativity and innovation and the great desire of communities to help and support older adults uh, thrive in our community well. So um, we're excited, but we also believe that the services that we're providing right now are literally lifeline services um, to the clients that are receiving them. There are not a lot of options out there, but you know, one of the best parts that I've heard recently, sir, uh, is the stories coming from our restaurant partners. You know, having restaurant staff writing notes on the food boxes to the seniors, um, having local community businesses support those restaurants by providing assistance for storage, for other things. It's truly community um, bringing together and using the best uh, for our seniors. So it's, 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 this program has really taught us a lot about the willingness of Angelinos to uh, just put their heart on their sleeve and really reach out to older people. So it's been a wonderful experience. Fantastic. Thanks. Thanks, Ms. Trejo. And, and Madam Chair, I'm hopeful that in the instruction, in this instruction that you give, that we can um, better utilize existing organizations that have perfected the art of boxing the staples and food that we've all been participating in for almost eight months now. Uh, and we can help keep those going through this program. And there are untold number of seniors uh, who are going to undoubtedly um, find this type of program very, very essential to their health yeah. and well-being. So I look forward to pushing this along as well. Thank you so much. Yes, Thank Mr. O'Farrell. Um, and uh, my instructions will include your, your input. Um, Ms. Rejo, so my understanding is that the FEMA funding was extended until November 8th. Is that correct? Yes, Madam Chair, it is. Okay, and will we find out if, there's an ex if, if there will be another extension? You know, when last you time they told us uh, 24 hours before oh, wow. the extension was to come in. So we found out the day before that that's we were being extended. So that's part of the, um, the reason that we were reaching out through this uh, report to you. Yeah. Uh, was to create some um, just continuity and expectation of continuity for both our providers and for our clients. Uh, it's very stressful for us not to know. You know, we were sending out postcards to our residents, and it creates so much distress when we're telling them that a program could come to an end when they're watching the news and they don't see uh, very close and in sight to their staying at home. So... Um, we are, you know, we, we've now said, you know, uh, we sent the last communication was the program will be operating until we tell you otherwise, just so that uh, we stop getting, you know, literally thousands of phone calls from people saying, how am I going to uh, make it through? So, uh, yeah, the stress that, the, you know, it's inherited in an emergency. We understand that. Um, and we're grateful for the support that we're getting uh, to ensure that the program uh, can continue great plates 
it's really helping our restaurant partners and it's definitely uh, providing a major need to our seniors. Yeah. Uh, but uh, we won't know probably till a day or two before it expires. All right, well, that's certainly understandable why um, folks would be so um, concerned um, about mm -hmm. about this. But yeah. so hopefully we will have better days soon. So I appreciate that. Yes, and then my last question to you is, in your report under the, bo the food box model, one mm -hmm. of the suggestions is to potentially partner with the LA Regional Food Bank. So do yes, you know if they have the capacity to serve the approximately 20,000 seniors that we're currently serving? You know, part of, uh, we have been developing and expanding our relationship with them. I haven't asked the specific numbers for them, uh, but I, I can do that. Um, we have been working with them tirelessly with our provider network. And actually, uh, when I've been talking to them, they wanted more of our providers to sign up to work with them, not fewer. So um, I am heartened by that, uh, that they do have capacity. Uh, and they actually have been positioning um, to grow their support of senior uh, populations in particular. And so that's why we started the partnership with them last fall, um, was to sort of bring our networks together uh, in being able to expand those opportunities. And that's what we have been doing. And so far I haven't gotten a please stop yet from them, but I will reach out just to make sure. And you know, all of this grows uh, incrementally. It's not gonna be overnight. Um, and it will be, it will not be everybody that would benefit from a box uh, of groceries. Um, we've been working with them. Um, and I can tell you that we've already had a lot of influence in modifying how they distribute the staples to the seniors um, because they had not realized that a lot of folks, older adults do not come to food banks because the food weighs too much for them to carry. And so we actually have been working with them to redesign their packaging and carrying so that it's easier for people with arthritis and other uh, problems with their hands, but also to uh, decrease the number of uh, food products they give and give it more often. So, so the reason so I'm the asking can actually th transport th it. So. Thank you. But the reason I'm asking is they're great to work with. And um, I know a lot of folks use them and I know they're stretched mm -hmm. thin. That's the only reason I'm asking. I think they're terrific. Yeah, no, no. And if we can continue to work with them, as well. we should. And if not, we need to know now in case there is an extension to this program. Just want to make sure we don't have our services interrupted and there's plan B Plan C, Plan D. That's the only reason yes, I'm asking. Thank you. Yes. Uh, Mr. Price? Mr. President, I just want to, want to just thank Laura again for her leadership. This has been an extraordinary job. As far as I'm concerned, whatever your budget requests are, they're, they're certainly reasonable, Laura, because we, we want this program especially to continue uh, and to move forward as it assists one of our most vulnerable populations, uh, our seniors. I know we want to increase the uh, efficiency uh, but I'm, uh, you know, I'm, I'm wary about limiting the number of restaurants. I think we ought to be trying to expand. I mean, I know you're, you're doing it for efficiency reasons, but it's been such a win-win situation for the restaurants uh, and for the seniors that I think that uh, a uh, limiting that program, uh, I think, hurts hurts everyone. I like the idea of uh, the grocery deliveries. Uh, certainly, uh, uh, in in the food giveaways that have been going on in our district and I think around the city, uh, you know. The, the folks are getting used to these boxes of groceries uh, and uh, being able to provide them in a more uh, compact, more strategic way, I think makes a lot of sense. Uh, we've been working closely with the food bank, uh, Madam President, the food bank here in South LA. I know they serve all of Los Angeles, but is based here in South LA. And in fact, they are expanding and, and have been working closely uh, in a number of the food giveaways, uh, working with a number of organizations and uh, providers uh, that have been uh, working to uh, make uh, make these foods available. And so I would agree with you that the incorporating the food banks uh, more strategically, I think it's something that we have to do. I think they're prepared to do it. They want to do it. Uh, and the provider network that's been assembled uh, through uh, the Department of Aging, I think has been, will be an important resource. So again, Laura, keep up the good work. And I will be back in touch with you about the community gardens. Thank and I think you. there is a pilot program there that we can implement, uh, especially during this time, that uh, will involve seniors and others in a way that uh, 
this underscores the, the need for food security in yes. our community. Thank you, Madam President. Thank you. I'm going to go ahead and um, hold this item in committee and request the following report back. One okay. is to instruct um, the CEO to review agents' request and potential CRF funding if FEMA doesn't extend the reimbursement period. Two, instruct the CEOs, the CEO to report back with recommendations on front funding for the senior meals program if FEMA continues to extend the reimbursement period. Three, instruct agent CLA and CEO to report back with additional program details on the food bank, the food box model, including how many seniors would potentially participate, how long would the program be in place, and what would the estimate cost of the program be? Okay? Well done. All right, thank you very much. Those are the instructions for item number three. Uh, there are no more items under, on our agenda, so our ad hoc committee is adjourned. Thank you very much.